On November 21, 2016, news helicopters from around the globe converged on the Panama Canal to capture history, the transit of USS Zumwalt, America's most advanced warship. At 4.4 billion, she cost more than a nuclear aircraft carrier. This roughly 15,600 ton destroyer was built to strike targets 100 miles inland. A revolutionary electric drive generated power for weapons that did not yet exist. But just five weeks after commissioning, Zumwalt wasn't moving. Salt water had leaked into her propulsion bearings, flooding her engines. She drifted helplessly between the canal walls as tugboats rushed alongside, fighting to keep her from smashing into concrete while tourists filmed from the banks. The destroyer, designed to be invisible on radar, had become the most watched vessel on Earth. At the turn of the century, the Arleigh Burke-class destroyer had become the centerpiece of the U.S. Navy's surface fleet. Designed in the final years of the Cold War, that class combined powerful radar, long-range missiles and anti-submarine systems in a tough all-steel hull. Even after the Soviet Union collapsed, these ships adapted to new missions, battle-tested in the Persian Gulf, Mediterranean and Western Pacific, firing missiles in combat, intercepting ballistic threats, and escorting carriers through contested waters. As geopolitical focus shifted, so did the Navy's priorities. With regional conflicts, coastal missile batteries, and urbanized shorelines posing different threats, planners envisioned a next generation of surface warships that could operate close to hostile shores to support ground forces and strike inland targets, all while evading radar and surviving concentrated attacks from smaller, fast-moving boats. In the late 1990s, they launched the DD-21 program, the 21st century land attack destroyer. The design called for a ship larger than the Burks, but harder to detect, with advanced 155mm long-range guns. After a major defense review around the turn of the millennium, the program widened in scope. The plan combined stealth, advanced firepower, and cutting-edge electronics in a single hull. It called for a fully electric propulsion system capable of generating enough power for future high-energy weapons. Extensive automation intended to reduce crew size from around 300 to roughly 95 sailors, and sensors integrated into the ship structure to minimize radar signature. The result would be unlike anything the Navy had operated before. The Zumwalt class, named after Admiral Elmo, Zumwalt, the youngest chief of naval operations in U.S. history, was envisioned as a fleet of 32 of the largest and most technologically advanced destroyers ever to enter frontline service. When Zumwalt first emerged from the shipyard, her size alone set her apart. At 610 feet long and more than 80 feet across the beam, she displaced roughly 15,600 tons, larger than many World War II cruisers. She also had a distinctive shape. The sides sloped inward above the waterline in a tumble-home profile a form once seen on early 20th century warships but revived to make radar waves glance away rather than bounce back. Her sharp, wave-piercing bow cut cleanly through seas, producing less wake and spray that might reveal her position. The deckhouse was built from composite materials, paneled in flat, angled planes to deflect radar. Masts and antennas were enclosed with no protrusions to catch a signal. Even engine heat was vented and cooled before leaving the ship while isolated machinery dampened vibrations that might betray her presence. Taken together, these measures made the 15,600-ton warship show up on enemy radar as little more than a fishing boat. Mounted forward were two 155mm advanced gun systems, each designed to fire the long-range land attack projectile, LR LAP. This rocket-assisted GPS-guided shell could strike targets over 80 nautical miles away, delivering sustained and precise bombardment in support of forces ashore, hitting command posts, air defenses, or artillery batteries deep inland. Compared to cruise missiles, the LR LAP promised more shots per mission and a lower cost per target, giving the ship a way to project power far beyond the coastline without exhausting its missile magazines. Along her hull edges, there were 80 Mark 57 vertical launch system cells capable of firing a range of missiles from Tomahawk land attack Missiles to SM-2 and SM-6 for air, defense, and accommodating anti-submarine weapons as needed. Two 30mm gun mounts covered close in defense against small craft. Below decks, the integrated power system could produce about 78 megawatts of electricity, enough to run the ship and all her weapons. In practice, automation reduced the crew only to around 140 sailors, 
rather than the originally projected 95, and included a planned aviation detachment. A flight deck and enclosed hangar could operate two MH-60 RC Hawks, or a heavy lift helicopter, while a stern bay could launch small boats for boarding or special operations. Every element was intended to deliver the Navy a ship decades ahead of its time, able to strike from the shadows, engage any target, and survive in waters where other destroyers could not. On paper, it was the most advanced surface combatant ever built. Translating the design into steel proved far more complicated. In early planning, the Navy expected each Zumwalt-class destroyer to cost roughly $1.4 billion, an estimate that assumed a production run of 32 ships to spread development costs. But nearly every major feature was new. The tumble-home hull, composite deckhouse integrated power system, peripheral VLS along the ship's sides, and most importantly, the advanced gun system, so manufacturing required specialized materials, unfamiliar shipyard techniques, and entirely new supply chains. Each of those demands lengthened schedules and pushed costs steadily higher. By 2008, with costs climbing and other priorities pressing, Navy leadership reconsidered the entire plan. After recalculation, they decided the Arleigh Burke class, still in production and already proven in service, could be built in larger numbers for far less money. That July, the Navy announced it would cut Zumwalt procurement from the original 32 to just two ships, with a third added later. That critical decision drove up the price of many unique components even more. By the time the first of her class, USS Zumwalt, was christened on October 28, 2013, she was already the largest and most expensive destroyer the Navy had built. Cost had climbed past $4 billion per ship by the mid-2010s. Many core technologies were still not fully mature, and some faced uncertain futures. Nonetheless, by late 2015, after years of design work, cost overruns, and construction delays, Zumwalt was finally ready to leave the yard. On a gray December morning, she eased away from Bath Iron Works under her own power for the first time, bound for sea trials with the dark Atlantic stretching ahead. Inside the Combat Information Center, displays flickered to life as radar sweeps began. On the bridge, navigation teams monitored progress while engines hummed through the new electric drive. Every turn, every acceleration, every system check was recorded, logged, and heavily scrutinized by Navy evaluators. On December 7th, during builders' trials off the coast of Maine, a call for help broke the steady rhythm of system checks and maneuvers. A nearby fishing vessel reported its captain in severe distress and in urgent need of evacuation. Zumwalt was one of the closest ships. A bridge team plotted a course and brought the destroyer alongside through cold gray swells. The crew lowered a rigid-hulled inflatable boat into frigid water, and its crew sped toward the fishing boat, spray freezing on their gear as they came alongside. Minutes later, they returned with the fisherman, who was quickly transferred to the ship's medical space where Navy corpsmen worked to stabilize him for further treatment ashore. Trials continued into the following year with refinements and adjustments along the way. On October 15, 2016, Baltimore's inner harbor filled with the sound of a Navy band tuning up. Under a clear autumn sky, the Navy's newest and most advanced destroyer, her composite superstructure standing out against the brick and glass of the city skyline, was officially commissioned. Crowds lined the pier and surrounding walkways as sailors in dress whites guided guests toward the ceremonial platform. Navy Secretary Ray Mabus spoke of Admiral Elmo Zumwalt, Jr., the ship's namesake, recalling his reforms as Chief of Naval Operations and his push for a modern, inclusive Navy. Captain James A. Kirk manned the rails alongside some of his crew as the national anthem played. After a short ceremony, the ship joined the active fleet. Cameras flashed, applause broke out, and the officers and crew of USS Zumwalt stood ready to begin service. To those who saw her that day, Zumwalt looked like the future of the American fleet, sleek, advanced, and ready to serve. Her captain declared her a technical marvel a multi-mission destroyer with stealth and combat power to take on the most challenging missions. But inside the Navy, unresolved questions lingered. Barely a month after Zumwalt joined the fleet, attention turned to her most distinctive weapons, a pair of 155mm advanced gun systems mounted on the bow, designed to fire a single-purpose-built round, the long-range land attack projectile, LRLAP. Originally the ship's signature capability, 
These rocket-assisted GPS-guided shells promised a level of sustained fire support no other Navy ship could match. In the autumn of 2016, however, the numbers behind that promise began to look different. The Elder Lap had been priced assuming a fleet of 32 ships and mass production runs. With only three hulls in the class, the ammunition order shrank to a fraction of its intended size, sending the per-round cost spiraling to nearly $800,000 an amount comparable to a Tomahawk cruise missile, which had greater range and a far heavier warhead, for a system meant to be a cost-effective alternative to missiles. The comparison was impossible to ignore. In November 2016, the Navy made the call. The long-range land attack projectile would not move forward into production, leaving Zumwalt's two advanced gun systems without usable ammunition before the ship completed post-shakedown workups. That same month, with news of the LR Lap cancellation still fresh, Zumwalt and her roughly 140-person crew began their first operational transit toward their new home port in San Diego. The route took her through the Panama Canal, a heavily trafficked waterway that demands precise control of a ship's engines and steering. On November 21, 2016, while passing through the canal, salt water from the cooling system leaked into bearings for the main propulsion motors, causing them to overheat and seize. The sudden loss of propulsion left Zumwalt to drift inside one of the most confined and unforgiving maritime choke points in the world. As canal tugboats took position alongside to prevent her from striking the walls or other vessels, the sleek destroyer, fresh from her commissioning ceremony and still smelling of paint, moved only under tow. From there, she was taken to Balboa, a port on the Pacific entrance to the canal, where Navy technicians and civilian engineers worked to diagnose the failure and plan repairs, including a partial dismantling of her propulsion system. By the end of the year, Zumwalt had spent barely a month in commission and already suffered two heavy blows. To the Navy, those quick, successive events were clear warning signs about the risks of packing so much new technology into a single ship. While Zumwalt sat in Balboa under repair, the rest of the class remained in the pipeline. The second ship, Michael Monsoor, had been launched five months earlier and was tied up for fitting out, her combat system still incomplete. The third, Lyndon B. Johnson, had yet to see her keel laid. Headlines were sharp, a $4 billion destroyer with no rounds for its main guns. Lawmakers pressed for answers about cost and capability, asking why the Navy had accepted delivery of a ship whose signature weapon was unusable. Criticism came from outside the Navy as well. Analysts pointed out that the program had stacked first-of-a-kind systems, from the tumble-home hull and composite deckhouse to the integrated power system and electric drive, into a single platform, multiplying the chance for delays and unexpected costs. Others questioned whether the tumble-home hull, so central to her stealth, would be as seaworthy as conventional designs in heavy weather. Journalist Sebastian Robin wrote that the cutting-edge Zumwalt had become a ship in search of a mission. The Navy now had three massive destroyers under construction or recently delivered, with no clear place for them in established fleet doctrine. The advanced gun system had been conceived to support Marines storming a beach or army units operating near the shore. Without affordable ammunition, that role evaporated. In December 2017, the Navy formally redefined the Zumwalt class mission. These costly, Initially, aimless vessels would become blue-water surface strike ships optimized to engage enemy warships and deliver long-range missile attacks against high-value targets. The decision reflected another strategic shift. By then, China was building a modern fleet at an unprecedented rate. New destroyers, cruisers, and aircraft carriers backed by land-based missile forces that could threaten U.S. ships across the Western Pacific. In a conflict over Taiwan or the South China Sea, American surface ships would need to operate far from shore to survive while still being able to strike high-value targets deep inside contested areas. That requirement matched the emerging Conventional Prompt Strike CPS program. A joint Navy-Army effort was developing a hypersonic boost glide weapon capable of traveling long distances at speeds above Mach 5 with a conventional warhead and extreme precision. For the Navy, finding a suitable launch platform was a priority and the Zumwalt class, with vast electrical capacity and open deck space, was an ideal candidate. Engineers initially explored fitting hypersonic weapons without removing the 155mm guns, but later studies showed replacing at least one advanced gun system mount was the most practical solution. By March 2022, the plan was public. 
Zumwalt, Michael Mansour, and Lyndon B. Johnson would each receive a battery of CPS missiles in the bow. The Navy expected the first installation before the end of the decade, and work began sooner than many anticipated. The shift gave the class a mission that played to its strengths. Hypersonics would allow them to engage time-sensitive targets, command bunkers, missile launchers, or warships in port from outside the range of most enemy defenses. Operating alongside carrier groups or as independent surface action units, they could threaten high-value assets across the Pacific in ways no other surface combatant could match. By 2024, preparations were underway at Ingalls Shipbuilding to remove Zumwalt's forward gun and fit the missile tubes. For the first time since her commissioning, she was on the verge of a capability that matched the scale of her design and a mission the Navy clearly needed. USS Zumwalt sat in Pascagoula, Mississippi in the final stages of a long transformation. At Ingalls, her forward 155mm advanced gun system had been removed and replaced with four massive launch canisters, each capable of holding three conventional prompt-strike hypersonic missiles. When complete, the ship would carry a battery of 12 weapons able to strike long-range targets at hypersonic speeds. A January 15th report from USNI News confirmed the work was nearly finished. At the same time, the second ship, USS Michael Monsoor, prepared for a Western Pacific deployment. She still carried her pair of advanced gun systems, but her future was set. Once she returned, she would follow Zumwalt's path, trading unused guns for hypersonic launchers. The third ship, USS Lyndon B. Johnson had also entered its integration phase. In the summer of 2025, Michael Mansour was sighted in Yokosuka, Japan. No coincidence, as she prepared to take up a forward role. Now, a Zumwalt-class destroyer could be positioned close to potential flashpoints. In the years to come, the arrival of one of these ships in a contested theater would carry a very different implication. Hypersonic strike capability was moving within reach, and projections called for all three ships to carry operational CPS missiles before the end of the decade. After years of cost overruns, technical setbacks, and questions about purpose, the Zumwalt class finally had a mission that matched its scale.